thankful for everyone that's returned this evening. Opportunity to pray together, to lift our voices, to look into the Word of God. Jeff and I were talking a little bit about our lessons, and we decided maybe they'll work together. We'll see after we get done uh, whether there's a fit or not. You know, there's a lot of things that uh, Jeff brought to our attention this morning, Think the work that needs to be done. And we're thinking about the work and trying to find ways to engage in that work. Uh, how do we, how do we uh, keep our enthusiasm? How do we keep our motivation? How is it that we can be dedicated to the work that we say we want to do, but then in our busyness and in our distractions, uh, we find that following through on that can be, can be challenging at times. So I begin to think about uh, enthusiasm, devotion, uh, words like that, and it, and it took me to the word in the scripture, the word zeal. So I began to look at the word zeal a little bit in the scripture, how it's defined and how it's used. And the first thing I was asking myself, well, is, is zeal a feeling or is it an action? Uh, I decided it's a little of both. There are uh, some practical definitions of zeal. I think uh, initially we might think of words uh, such as eagerness, uh, enthusiasm, devotion, diligence. I think uh, Strong's would associate all of those uh, synonyms with the word zeal. Strong's um, concordance, is that the right word? Uh, the, the Greek word is... Is zeal, it's uh, zealous, I think maybe if I was going to try to pronounce it. And I began to look in, in the context of the scripture, how is that word used? So we think about words like devotion, commitment, diligence, enthusiasm. I also want to take us to the root word in the Greek. And the root word is uh, basically to boil up or to be on fire, heat, fervency, fervidness. That's not a word you hear very often, but you can hear the root there. Excessive heat. If something is fervid, it is on fire, but it's, it's, it's an uncontrolled fire. You might think of those occasions where, like Chernobyl, was an accident where there was heat that was on by design but the nuclear reactor was stressed beyond its technical capabilities and that heat went fervid and it melted down the the nuclear core and created great disaster but that's what that word gets to it's a boiling over uh, if you put a pot of spaghetti or something on the stove and you walk away like I do and you come back and you got a mess and maybe you've got a fire in your kitchen if you're not careful. But that's the kind of idea behind that word. Enthusiasm, eagerness, devotion, diligence all have that implication of, of pressing uh, uh, against uh, limits, the parameters of our lives <laughs> Zeal is, is, is challenging to us. And it's meant to be bringing us to the point of boiling over. That's what the word means. And in Romans chapter 12, Josh read to us from that already, there are several uh, short little wonderful, wonderful phrases of things that talk about our relationship to one another. And our, and our opportunities with one another. To be like-minded, to show patience, and to show joy, and to show prayer. It says in verse 12. Just great little ideas like show, share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. But go back to verse, to verse 9 here. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep the spiritual fervor. 
serving the Lord. And then it goes on with these other ideas of very practical ways you can demonstrate that, that boiling over of your commitment and your diligence that stems from your love of Christ. The, the, the context here of, of Romans chapter 12 uh, you know, is one of verse 1, offering your bodies as a, as a living sacrifice. Later in that introduction to the chapter, it talks about we've, we've got different gifts, but, but the gifts we've been given are, are so that, that Christ is glorified. And these things include con, is service and contributing to the needs of others. And these are the kind of things for which Paul says you're to be devoted and honoring and not lacking in zeal in these things. But keep, keep your spiritual fervor. And so that implies to me too, like, you know, once you got the heat up, once you got to that boiling place, it's the idea of maintaining that, that fervor, that commitment, that boiling up of your hearts that leads you to all of these things that are, that are addressed here in Romans 12. Zeal isn't only an expression of an attitude, but it's essentially an adverb that's describing the work here. You do these things with fervency. You show your commitment to one another your, hate, your hatred for evil should be a boiling over hatred of evil. You do that with everything you got. You do that with a full commitment. This, these, these bullet points here in verse 11. Never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. That's the key. Our service to the Lord is how we treat one another. That should be obvious to a Christian. And yet, we cool off. And we lose that zeal sometimes. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Faithful in prayer. Share with God's people. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Each one of those is just a quick, short, verb and subject but then the but then the adverb is do each of these to to the point of boiling over to the point of a diligence and a commitment that you cannot contain that's what zeal is it's a combination of an attitude with an adverb that describes the work we do zeal is uh, feverish would be another way to describe it. And I think about fever and when the body has a fever, it's, it's, uh, it's the body's attempt to stave off infection by stirring up the action of the cells. Let's, let's get so hot that we're going to kill the contagion that is trying to invade the body. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 1 and 2. Paul said, There's no need for me to write to you about the service of, of the saints, for I know your eagerness to help. And I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. So this, this fever... This, this, this zeal, enthusiasm, has actually now infected others with enthusiasm. And they want to do the work too. So that heat has, has spread and has caused others to want to engage in similar things. Zeal works in, in combination with those other action words I was talking about. Let's just turn over a couple 
pages to, to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And let's look at what it says here regarding sort of a, sort of a combo effect, if you will. Um, I picked up my NIV because I like the way it read it in some of the things I was reading on earlier, but this one's kind of small print. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you have given him, he, he told us about your longing for me, your deep, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorrow, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. Or you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. This zeal, this, this, this combination of their, of their regard, for, for Paul, he was told of their longing for him, their, their strong affection. They have a longing. That's almost kind of a melancholy idea. They missed it. But they had a, a, a longing, a desire to be united, a strong affection towards him. And, and the morning, they lamented. They lamented their sins. But that, but that zeal that they had, that that commitment that they had worked in combination with these other attitudes that they needed to take. And because their, their zeal, because their ardent desire is based upon a willingness to serve God, though they were hurt, it was only for a little while. And it didn't lead to harm. What Paul had to say to them stung. But he delivered it out of zeal for their good. And they were good enough because of their ardent desire towards him to receive it. Without letting it become a barrier between them. They never lost their commitment for him as their spiritual teacher. Because their first commitment, their first love, was in Christ. And so that zeal worked together with these other concerns that Paul had to where the, the zeal that they had gave them forgiveness of Paul for being so forward, if that's the word you want to use. And it was a, it was a self-healing heat. That, that love for God kept them from taking offense to where they held it against Paul for only a short time. And they moved on. They moved on. Verse 10 and 11. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See that this godly sorrow has produced in you what eagerness, what, excuse me, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. The godly sorrow that they felt didn't become that which stopped them from moving forward. And in fact, it was again, the, you, you get the sense that, that there's a boiling up of these other attributes that they had because of their first love, their commitment for justice and righteousness. It says because they weren't harmed in any way because they had such readiness to see justice done. I mean, it's such a great attitude. It's such a great attitude because they, they, 
they almost jumped at the chance here to show with, with earnestness and, and eagerness to clear themselves. Do you see that, that same boiling over idea in the way that they attacked the problem that was raised by Paul in their presence? Rather than attacking the messenger, they attacked the problem. And they did it with, with earnestness and eagerness. I say that's zeal. That's how this works. And, uh, almost as, as, a, as a demonstration to themselves. Verse 12, so even though I write to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong or the injured party, but rather that before God you could see for yourself how devoted you are to us. So this whole, this whole matter became a demonstration of how they were not going to allow their love for justice and their love for Christ get in the way of their relationship with the one who brought their error to their attention. And, and Paul says it, was a, it became a, a demonstration so that you could see, oh, I, I really am on fire for God. I really am boiling over with a love for the things that are of God. And because I've got that almost fevered, uncontrolled desire to do the right thing, these things couldn't hinder us. And not only, we did, not only did we just move forward, we did so with eagerness and earnestness. That's how zeal is supposed to work. This, this is an example of how passion is supposed to work. Commitment, devotion, enthusiasm. Enthusiasm for the right thing. It's, it's just laid out here in front, and Paul says, can't you see what you did here? Isn't this cool? We're able to look back at this now and say, man, that was, that was a really interesting display of your devotion to us. And Paul's obviously grateful for it. Paul's reminding them of their enthusiasm for God and their diligence to be faithful. Look back in verse 2 and 3 of the same chapter. Paul said, make room for us in your hearts. Make room for us in your hearts. Now, again, because of how this is written, Paul has acknowledged that they've done that. Right? Down there in verse 13, he said, this was a demonstration that, that, your, that your, their, your devotion conquers anything that can come between us. But he says in verse 2, make room for us in your hearts. We've wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. I don't say this to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die for you. And I have great confidence in you. I take great pride in you. I'm really encouraged. In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. How is this encouraging to Paul? Having to, having to rebuke the way that he did. What made this encouraging? How did he know that they had room for Paul in their hearts because of the way they responded to the message? Because of their love for justice. And, and they tackled this with the same kind of devotion and passion and fire that we sometimes use when we go after someone that we think has wronged us. And that's not what zeal is for. That's not what zeal is for. 
their, their, their diligence in being faithful actually opened their hearts to a greater capacity of love for Paul because they knew his love was genuine. How did they know his love was genuine? How did that open their hearts for a greater capacity to love? How did they know Paul was genuine? Because he told them something hard to say. He loved them enough to tell them a hard thing. And they responded in the way that zeal is to have the response in the heart of a Christian. And Paul says, I'm so encouraged by you. See, sometimes we think troubles are the things that discourage us. But the truth is, it's our reaction to troubles that are much more discouraging than the troubles themselves. And that's unfortunate. But if we, if we react as those in Corinth did, look at all the good things that can come out of it. Look at the growth. Look at the further commitment. Look at how they now have Paul and even a greater spot in their hearts than they did before any of this occurred. Let's look over at James chapter 3 for a moment. James chapter 3. Um... Uh, there's some concern here regarding zeal. Uh, verse 13, James chapter 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a, raise a harvest of righteousness. Somewhere in that passage, it doesn't jump out at me in, in the NIV, but I think it's probably the idea of, of uh, selfish ambition. I'd have to go back and check. But somewhere is that word zealon, that Greek word jealousy or zealousy uh, or zealousness. It's, it's really, really hard to tell jealousy from zealousness. But jealousy serves my ambition and zealousness serves God's ambition. And that's the difference. That's the difference. It can look and sound very much alike to an honest-hearted listener. It can sound like almost the same thing. In fact, we looked at uh, how Paul rejoiced uh, in class this morning on Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. He said, when, when Christ was preached out of selfish ambition, I was happy about that because at least Christ was preached. Now, they did it out of selfish ambition. And so the warning here in James chapter 3 is from the perspective of the speaker, not the perspective of perspective of the receiver. Paul said, people heard about Christ and that's all I cared about. Even though their motivations were poor. In James it says, you can have poor motivation and you can have a form of wisdom, but if it's out of zeal for yourself or jealousy for your own interest, it may sound a lot alike on the surface and I might not be able to tell the difference. I might not know from your own example. What is the source of that boiling up? What is the source of that devotion and diligence to what you ascribe to? I may not know. But 
over in Galatians, the word enthusiasm is explored a little bit. And because jealousy and zealousness, there's no zealousy, I don't think. There's jealousy. Maybe there's jealousness. I don't know. But they're, they're really the same word. They really, really are the same word in the Greek. And that's an example where we have two words to say the same word that the Greeks had for one. There's lots of other examples where the Greeks have two and three and four words for where we use one word. So that's not so uncommon. That's not so unusual. But we've broken that into two words which sound a lot alike because one generally has a, a, a positive connotation and one has a negative connotation in how we've used them in English. But in, in the Greek, they're the same word. Galatians chapter 4, I think I said, beginning in verse 12. Let's see here. I plead with you, brothers, become like me, for I became like you. You've done me no wrong. As you know, I was, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, if I were Christ Jesus himself. What happened to all your joy? I can testify that. If you could have done so, you would have torn out your own eyes and given them to me. How I now became your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people, verse 17, are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may be zealous for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good. And to be so always, and not just when I'm with you. My dear children, for whom I again in the pains of childbirth into Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and, and, and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. So here's a, here's a much different outcome in that that zeal has now become where there was such a such a strong devotion in the past paul says you you give your eyeballs to me if i ask you but what's happened zeal can go off the rails enthusiasm paul says is fine it's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good. Enthusiasm actually has in the Greek its root um, full of God. Enthusiasm has in its root full of God. So that means enthusiasm has to have proper source and proper motives. And Paul says, that's all good until it's not. It's, it's just a warning to us. It could be that we have an old tradition, maybe, that we hang on to, but it was never authoritative. It's just a tradition. But we have that devotion anyway, and that's fine. There's, there's no problem with devotion to our traditions unless those traditions need to move aside for some reasonable cause, for some purpose. And maybe it's a new teaching that is to our liking, but we've drifted away from the source. I can't have enthusiasm for something that's not full of God. Because then I'm breaking the rules that that's what the word means. You know, so enthusiasm's got to stay within the framework of that which God has, has authorized. How do we have genuine zeal? What is, what is genuine zeal versus can we fake zeal? Can it be contrived? Can it be uh, uh, zeal on the surface, but it's absence of any really true devotion? I think we probably can. In, in politics, um, you'll sometimes hear a discussion about uh, building uh, support for an idea or building support for a candidate or a cause. 
And, and sometimes you'll hear that referred to as well. You know, the support that that cause has is grassroots support. Or you may hear, well, the, the support you hear for that cause is AstroTurf. And we know AstroTurf is fake grass. And when it comes to grassroots support versus AstroTurf, typically what people mean by using those phrases is one was from what you want to call the base up, upward. It came up from the ground. It, it sprang up genuinely in the hearts of people that this is something we really need to do. This is a cause, this is a, a change in the law, or this is a candidate that we really need to support. Whatever it is, it came from the, it came from the soil up. And AstroTurf's where you lay down the fake grass. And that's when you spend a bunch of money on, on uh, advertising and marketing, and that's when you have a bunch of lobbyists show up that want to take you out for dinner. And that's AstroTurf. And it, it kind of looks like the same thing because people say, well, you know, if we're going to move this idea, we're going to have to get organized, we're going to have to do this, we're going to have some rallies, we're going to, you know, spread the idea around. But being one on the inside, I can tell you AstroTurf and grassroots don't feel the same. And athletes that play ball on those surfaces will tell you the same thing too. They don't feel the same. And from what little sports I know, you know I know very little, what I have heard is that AstroTurf can cause injuries because of traction issues. There's different ways that the foot knows its place on fake grass compared to the real deal. I've heard that. You may tell me that's made up. I don't know. Will love for the truth ever conflict with our love for one another? I want you to think about that just a second. Will a devotion to the truth, will a devotion, a commitment, a boiling over for what we believe to be right ever conflict with our love for one another as saints? Do you think that can happen? Let's look at James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and verse 12. Speak and act as those who are willing to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, liberty. Those who show no mercy will be shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is James' words. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Will my zeal, will my genuine zeal, will my heartfelt devotion to love of the truth ever put me at conflict with a true love for the true family of God? Do you have your answer? With true love comes that spirit of wanting justice that prevents that from happening. That's what Paul experienced. That's why he was encouraged. That's why he was lifted up by the things that he did that were hard. But if I have a true, ardent commitment to the love of Christ and his word, and I am in a conflict with a brother who's a true brother, 
I know how that needs to be resolved. I know how that needs to be resolved because James tells me how to resolve. I hope that you have used this lesson on zeal. We are talking about things like trying to move forward instead of looking back. I think someone has used the word reboot now. And, and I've admitted to you and Jeff's admitted to you that we have areas we'd like to work on on ourselves, for ourselves. <laughs> Not you, but for me. And we'll get there. I agree with Jeff. I think we have a golden opportunity to examine ourselves and see where we want to be as a family of God's people. And I think a true commitment to God, having enthusiasm full of God, will get us where we want to go. Because the power of God exceeds the power of man. It's just really that easy. And we have to learn to put ourselves aside. And we have to learn to commit. And commit to the work. And commit to the love. And commit to the commitment of one another. And of the truth. Please be part of that commitment, every one of us. I hope our recommit is boiling over to where it's enthusiastic and it spreads. That it creates a fever within all of us. It would be my hope that we all feel an energy, a drive, a purpose in the things that we do within our, well, among ourselves, but especially as we, as we talk about reaching out to the lost world. The lost world needs something to get excited about. The lost world needs something to boil over about. And they're not gonna find it on TikTok or they're not gonna find it by climbing mountaintops and asking gurus. They're gonna find it in the word of God. But they won't find it left with the idea that these folks are dead. There's no zeal there. There's no commitment. Why, sh why should I be part of that? So, puts a lot of responsibility on me to be zealous, to work hard, to work right. And in doing that work, it's not about me knocking others out of the way so I can get to heaven. It's about taking folks with me. If you have any need this evening, and we can help you in any way, I beg you to, to consider letting us know what those concerns are. What are your needs? And we will try to work together towards a common goal. Please let us know.